What's going on? It's Ethan J here and welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be a little bit different, mainly because I'm not going to be on Photoshop, but with this channel, I always plan to try and help designers beyond just showing design breakdowns and stuff like that. So this is going to be one of those videos. Today I want to talk about navigating the sports design industry, mainly as a freelancer, but also a bit about my story and how I got started. Right, so I think we should start with who the f*** am I? And why am I even qualified to be giving advice on this subject in the first place? Well, I'm a graphic designer, if that wasn't already obvious, from London, UK, and I've worked with some of the most recognisable and well-known sports brands in the world somehow. Most notable are probably my designs for the NBA, a company I've been working closely with for about six years now, and I produce a bunch of their social media content. But I've also worked for a bunch of other companies as well, like the Premier League, Bundesliga, Puma, Rock Nation Sports, just to name a few. But I wasn't always doing sports design. In fact, for the first two years of my freelance career, I was more focused on doing corporate stuff. So like making websites and business cards and all that kind of stuff. And even then that was part time because my main job was working in a supermarket stacking shelves. During that time too, I also had some internships. I remember working at an internship for an architecture company. That didn't go great. I wasn't the biggest fan of architecture design and the stuff was, was pretty boring, but the experience was good. Now, over that 24 month period, I was constantly, constantly uploading on Behance and I was focusing on sports design. And the main reason I was focusing on sports is because there was always high resolution photos of athletes on Google. This was before I knew there was any kind of sports design community or before I even knew this was a viable career option. I was just doing it because there was high res photos. <laughs> Cause you gotta remember, this was even before social media was as prominent as it is today. So after those two years of constantly putting out work in between my freelance projects and my day job at the supermarket, the NBA actually reached out to me regarding my sports designs I was posting on Behance. Now, I didn't think it was really NBA. I thought this was some kind of troll. I thought it was a joke. And I went full CIA hacker mode and tried to figure out how to find an IP address from an email. Then I had to find out how to track an IP address back to a location. When I tell you I was so serious about this, but yeah, I figured out how to find the location from an IP address and found out that the email came from New York around the NBA headquarters area. So I was like, what? I was like, what the heck? I couldn't believe it. I honestly couldn't believe it. Now I figured out it was really them and I had a back and forth with them. They offered me a 30 day contract to provide some designs here and there. During that time, I made the conscious decision that I was going to become indispensable to this company. I was going to be available 24 seven whenever they needed me and produce the work before the end of the deadline, go above and beyond, just do everything that I could to become an asset to them. Mainly because I knew this is what I wanted to do. Even though I didn't realize sports design was a thing, I knew that this kind of field was exactly what I wanted to work in. So I decided I was going to go 100% no matter what. And six years later, I'm still working for them. So I think that was a pretty good decision. Then after I had an MBA as a client, I actually approached the Premier League. And this was before they was doing all the amazing stuff that they're doing on their social medias right now. Back then they were just kind of posting pictures and kind of infographics that were a little bit corporate, a little bit boring. So anyway, I reached out to them on email. Well, I reached out to the, the company that is responsible for handling the Premier League social media. And I said to them, hey, I make this kind of stuff for the NBA. Maybe I could make some similar stuff for you guys. And they was actually like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> to my surprise. So yeah, I ended up working with the Premier League for about a year, just creating some social content for them. And that was me using the leverage of one client to gain another one, which is exactly what you should be doing as a designer. Trying to use the work that you've done with one client to then get another client. And it just continued to snowball and snowball from there. But yeah, that is the quick version of my story of how I got started in the industry. So with that out of the way and my kind of credentials proven that I can talk on this subject as I've been around the block a couple of times, let's get into the tips that I have for designers getting started in this industry and just designers in this industry that want to make the next step. Number one is mainly for young designers and that is create every single day. Try and put out new content on social media as much as you can. This doesn't necessarily need to be your best work. This just needs to be something. You need to put in the hours, you need to put in the reps so you can get to that professional level. And by working every single day and putting out content, you're gonna get there so much faster and so much easier. Because by giving yourself a project to do every single day, you're gonna learn brand new things, you're gonna try out different things just out of necessity and holding yourself responsible and posting every single day is really gonna help with sticking to it. Also, I will say, post the work. Don't just leave it there and leave it sitting in a folder on your computer because you want to get it out there. Plus it will be good to look back on and see how fast and how much you grew. But I promise you, if you set aside six months to a year and just do this, knock this out and produce content every single day, you're going to grow exponentially and you're not going to believe the progress that you can make. Number two is portfolio. 
This is your currency as a freelancer and it is your main asset when you're trying to get new clients. Put in the time to curate an amazing portfolio that's filled with the work that you would love to get paid to do. Now, this isn't just the stuff you're posting on your Instagram. This is the best of the best. This is the top tier of the work that you are producing. And don't just post a photo on Behance and stuff like that. Making a pretty picture is not enough anymore. And there's so many designers out there that can do it. What you wanna do is you wanna post a brief as well. You wanna show how you're solving a problem. With design, you're constantly trying to figure out ways to help your client. And what a client is gonna be looking for is creative ways to solve these problems that they have. So if you're showing that you can do that within your portfolio, it's definitely going to give you a leg up. Also, showing that you can tackle these problems is great, especially if you don't have like a degree or other kind of higher education qualifications. Like me, I didn't go to school for design well. Well, I went to college for design, but I didn't do great. I didn't get grades good enough to kind of give it to a prospective client. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so yeah, you really want to show how you can understand the brief and nail it. And number three, don't just offer design. Obviously you wanna have design be your bread and butter, you want that to be your foundation. But if you have something else that you can offer, it's just another way to provide solutions for your potential clients. For me, it was animation and 3D kind of stuff. Like I've always been kind of good at After Effects because I've been using it for years and years. Same with 3D. So they was the kind of thing that differentiated me. And that's what you want. You want something that separates you from the rest of designers looking for that job. For you, it might be logos and branding or even illustration. Just have something else that you're really good at and that supports your graphic design. This is 100% gonna make you way more appealing to clients. Number four, pricing. Now, this is a taboo subject that a lot of freelancers in all kinds of fields don't really want to talk about. And it is a difficult subject to talk about because it's so subjective to your skill level, experience level, where you live, all of that kind of stuff. And project prices can vary so much from $100 to over $1,000. If you've already got some clients and you're still figuring out how to price, try to break it down like this. Figure out how much you want to make in a year, break that down then into a month and then realistically break that down into the amount of clients that you get within that month. If you're not hitting those targets, you might be off with your pricing. Obviously you wanna keep these prices realistic, but if you're off or you're way off, then that's a good indication that you should be charging a little bit more. There's also the discussion of whether you should charge hourly or by project. Me personally, I charge per project because I'm quite a fast worker. So if I charge by the hour, I feel like I'll be doing myself a disservice because a project that might take someone else like a day or two to do, I might get done in a couple of hours. And that's not just a two mile own horn, I'm just a fast worker. That's just how I've always been. So you need to think about what is the best pricing structure for you. If you're similar to me and you work fast, I would definitely recommend charging per project. If you take a bit more time on your projects, then charging hourly may be more beneficial, but that is completely up to you and completely different person to person. You also wanna reevaluate your prices every single year. Inflation is a thing. And also if your experience level rises and you work with more clients during that year, you need to be able to raise your prices to match that. Now to fully break down how I would charge a client like I said, it's per project, but I let them know upfront that with this per project price, this comes with two rounds of edit. So they can come back to me and say, we want to change this and that two times. After that, I then charge hourly for the additional rounds of feedback. And that's just the way that works for me. But yeah, you need to consider your options and figure out what works best for you. Now, and number five is getting lucky. Now you're probably thinking, Ethan, how can getting lucky be a tip? Well, I think there's different kinds of luck. There's one kind of luck where you might be born into a family or a situation where they have connections. The other kind of luck is what I experienced where the NBA stumbled upon my Behance project. Now this luck happened by me constantly putting out sports related work. Was it still lucky? Yes, 100%. But I also put the odds in my favor by putting out so much content for those two years, if that makes sense. And also, while luck plays a part, you wanna be ready for these opportunities that you're gonna get. Because I promise you, if you're consistently putting out high level work for an extended period of time, lucky breaks are gonna come your way because that's just the nature of how things work. On social media especially, posting on social media is kinda of like buying a lottery ticket. You don't know what is really gonna resonate with the broader social consciousness, but you try, you try and aim for that. And your post might go viral. And when I say viral, I don't necessarily mean it's getting a million likes and five million impressions. It could just go viral within your community and they could get like a thousand likes or 5,000 impressions. That's still 5,000 eyes on your project and that could lead to something. And that is still seen as lucky, but you are really stacking the odds in your favor. And by putting in all of that groundwork and focusing on improving and posting content every single day and really growing your skill range, you're gonna be ready to seize these opportunities when they do inevitably come around. You don't wanna be that guy that gets a great opportunity and isn't ready to take advantage of it. So yeah, like I said, luck definitely plays a part, but you can definitely make the odds lean on your side, which is exactly what you wanna do by constantly putting out work 
work and constantly putting our stuff on your portfolio, high quality work that you want to get paid to do. Right, this is a bonus tip and that is personal finance. This can apply to everyone, even employees, but especially for freelancers, as we don't always necessarily know where our next paycheck is coming from. Just a quick disclaimer, this is not financial advice. I'm just a guy on the internet that's been doing freelance for a while and I've learned some things that work for me and they might work for you. Now, this could be an entire video on its own. So if you'd like to see a video like this where I break down more in-depth things about personal finance and things that I've done, leave a comment, let me know and I can definitely get that done. Right, so a couple of points that I wanna go over for personal finance are, one, and this is probably the most important, get an emergency fund. Ideally, this would be six to 12 months worth of expenses saved in an instant access account. I think this is super important. I'd done this before I decided to go out and venture freelance 100%. Before I quit my job at the supermarket, I had a little nest egg there and just having that security behind me made me go after freelancing that bit harder, knowing that I have something to fall back on should the worst happen. So if there's anything you take away, if you're thinking about becoming a freelancer, make sure you have that emergency fund. It will be so beneficial for you. Next is get a basic understanding of stocks and shares. Now, I'm not telling you to become the next Wolf of Wall Street or anything like that. I'm just telling you to get a basic understanding. This is gonna just break down that fear barrier that you might have and you just really wanna familiarize yourself with what stocks and shares are and why they can be so beneficial to you. Leading on from that, I would say find out what your country's pension schemes or accounts are. In the UK, we have this thing called a SIP and that's a self-invested personal pension. And that lets you invest in all kinds of stocks and shares yourself as your pension fund. And you can pull it into an account and you access it when you get to retirement age. I know when you're young, especially if you're a teenager, or something like that, retirement seems like so far away that there's no point in even thinking about it. But trust me, learn up on it, research about it and get it set up. I promise you the sooner you start, the better. Finally, you wanna look into tax-free savings accounts. In the UK, we have these things called ISAs or individual savings accounts, specifically stocks and shares ISAs. Again, it's similar to the retirement account. It lets you invest in stocks and shares and all that kind of stuff within a savings account. But the difference is all the profits that you make from an ISA are completely tax free. Obviously, there's a limit with these kind of accounts. And I think it's like that in different countries. But I'm pretty sure all these different countries have similar things set up. Look into it and see how you can make the most of it. And yeah, those are my quick personal finance tips. But like I said, I could do a whole video on this. So yeah, let me know if you would like to see that. Now, just to recap, let's go over these top tips one more time. So that is create, create, create every single day, especially for young designers, constantly put out work, get the hours in, get the reps in, and it will raise your level of design so much in such a short period of time. Two, portfolio curate an amazing portfolio. Don't just show one-off graphics, share the brief that you gave yourself if it's not client work and show how you tackled these problems. All of this stuff is key for clients. Free, don't just offer design. Have a different skill that you can present to the client. This will separate you from other designers that might be looking for the exact same job as you and make you a standout candidate. Four, we talked about pricing. So like I said, you wanna figure out how much you wanna make a year, monthly, how that can fit into the clients that you currently have. Reevaluate your pricing every year and also figure out whether you wanna charge per project or buy hourly. I told you how I do it, but for you, something else might be more beneficial. And at five, we talked about luck and stacking a deck in your favor for you to get lucky. Then being prepared for when these lucky breaks do come around and they will come around if you stay consistent and you're always putting out high quality work, trust me. But that's it, they are my top tips for making it in the sports design industry mainly as a freelancer because that's where I have all of my experience, but I feel like a lot of these things are transferable into other fields and other areas of design. If you found this video helpful in any way, please drop a like. And if you're not already subscribed, consider hitting that sub button and notification bell so you could be notified when I drop another video just like this one. My next video is gonna be the first episode from my Collabo Shop series. So that should be a lot of fun. But until then, I will catch you on the next one. Peace.